Ryan, and you are listening to Restitutio, a podcast that seeks to recover authentic Christianity and live it out today. This is our first of five examples of bias in translation. Today, we'll examine Philippians 2, 6 through 7, specifically focusing on how translators render two theologically important words. We'll see how a couple of the most popular evangelical versions break free from the underlying Greek syntax in order to inject their own doctrinal bias into Scripture. But regardless of your own interpretation of this passage, and there are several viable interpretations of Philippians 2, can't we all agree that translators should at least not read their beliefs into Scripture? Here now is episode 348, part 19 of our Bible class, God's Form or God's Nature, translating Philippians 2, 6 through 7. We're now in the third and final part of this class on how we got the Bible. Uh, We looked at the text of Scripture, spent a lot of time looking at manuscripts and how scholars compare these different manuscripts to each other to arrive at the earliest and best readings for different verses throughout the whole Bible. Uh, Secondly, we looked at translation philosophies and decisions. And now we're on to the subject of bias. And I realize this might not necessarily fit in with the theme, how we got the Bible, but to some people, but I, I believe it is absolutely critical for Bible readers to understand that there is such a thing as bias and that bias, although I'm not saying it's corrupted the whole Bible, there there are certain corners of the Bible that this does play a significant role and people just need to be aware of it uh, so that they can make their own decisions. So last time I explained how bias enters into our translations. We looked at single translator Bibles. We looked at committee translator Bibles. We looked at dynamic equivalents. We looked at formal equivalents and saw how all these different elements bring in or make possible a certain amount of bias in translation. And for this, in the next four episodes, we're going to look at specific examples. And for today, we're going to look at Philippians chapter 2. Here is Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 from the ESV, which reads, Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. You can see there, I also have the Greek, probably over a thousand books have been written on, on just these verses right here. I see really two main issues here, going back to the ESV. One is this phrase, the form of God, and the other is the phrase, a thing to be grasped. And I'll just highlight it up above as well for those of you who follow along in the original languages. That says, morphi theou, form of God. This is the word in there, in the form of God. And then down here, a thing to be grasped is arpagmon, or uh, if you prefer the Erasmian pronunciation, harpagmon. Uh, And so these are two words that have different translation possibilities going on. So let's take the second one first, arpagmon, and take a look at what this word means. Now what I'm going to do is cite for you the BDAG, that's the standard Greek dictionary that translators and others use for the New Testament, and it reads as follows. One, a violent seizure of property, robbery. And then they go on to say, next to impossible in Philippians 2.6. This is the dictionary. It's not a commentary. It's a dictionary. But since this word is not used very many places, they're very much conscious that people interested in Philippians 2.6 are going to be reading this dictionary entry. So they say there's no way that it means a violent seizure. It's not like Jesus was trying to rob God of equality or something like that. It goes on, the state of being equal with God cannot be equated with the act of robbery. And then definition number two for apagmas is something to which one can claim or assert title by gripping or grasping something claimed. And then under definition A there, it says, it can be taken sensu malo, that's a Latin phrase, bad sense, to mean booty, a grab, and only the context and an understanding of Paul's thought in general can decide whether it means holding fast to something already obtained or the appropriation to oneself of something that is sought after. Definition 2b. But a good sense is also possible. A piece of good fortune, windfall, prize, gain, 
Again, it remains an open question whether the windfall has already been seized and is waiting to be used or whether it has not yet been appropriated. In favor of the former is the contrast between Adam, implied as a dramatic foil, and his anxiety about death and equality with God, and Jesus' majestic freedom from such anxiety, with culmination in the ultimate vindication of Jesus, whose destiny contrasts with Adam's implied fate, not considering equality with God a prize to be tenaciously grasped. Basically, this word can mean two different things in the context of Philippians chapter 2, verse 6. It can either mean something that you don't have that you're reaching for, that you're grasping for, or something that you do have that you're not taking advantage of or exploiting. The word can legitimately mean either one of those things, and what has to determine it for you, according to the dictionary, is your theology. <laughs> in other words, this is one of those cases where there's no way not to inject your theology into translation. And sometimes that's the case. And I wanted you to see a clear example of that. So taking a look at how translations do this, the ESV, the NASB, the NET, and the, the NAB, and the NJB all translate it grasp at as if it's something you don't have. Whereas the NLT, the NIV, the GNT, the CSB, and the NRSV translate it as exploit, as in something that you do have. And as far as I know, there's no way to preserve that Greek word's ambiguity in the English language. So translators just have to simply make a decision, whichever one they think is better, and then that becomes a translation. However, when they do that, it's their responsibility to put a footnote, explaining that there's another way this could have been translated, and we went this way for these reasons, right? Uh, ideally, they would give that much information. A lot of times, footnotes are very, very sparse, and they'll just say, or uh, something to be exploited, or, or something to be grasped at. And that really at least can clue you in to what is going on here. And this is why it's so important for you to look at the footnotes when you're studying the Bible. I think if you're just reading, you know, devotionally, reading in the morning, and you're just trying to get the scope of Scripture and enjoy it, that's fine. But if you're doing Bible study, you really do need to read those little footnotes and those little extra bits in the margin that give you information. And publishers generally don't like footnotes. So, you know, so if, if there's anything there, it's, it's going to be usually significant, unless you've got like a study Bible and it's just like everywhere. So let's leave our Pogmon alone for now and get to the really juicy phrase, Morphe Theu, the form of God. Let's take a look at that. So the ESV translates it as I showed you before, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but empty himself by taking the form of a servant. Okay? The NIV totally diverges. It says, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. So you can see there's a consistency here, nature for nature, form for form, between form of God and form of a slave or a servant. The NLT reads, though he was God, so it's even stronger still, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave. How do you spot bias? Parallelisms, that's another way you can spot bias. ESV believes that the word morphe should be translated form. The NIV believes it should be translated nature. But in both cases, when there's a parallel phrase, they remain consistent. However, the NLT inserted an inconsistency, which tipped their hand that they're not really being honest with the text. So in the one play, case, the NLT reads, though he was God, and in the other case, he's in the humble position of a slave. In order for us to see what the evangelical bias is here, we can look at non-evangelical Bible translations and scholarship on Philippians chapter 2, verse 6. So let's check outside the evangelical tent. So if, if we think of a bunch of different tents the evangelicals are one of them, we can look outside that tent at the mainline tent. That would be what? The NRSV. The Jewish tent. 
We can look at Jewish Bible translations. We can look outside that at the Catholic tent, the New American Bible, the New Jerusalem Bible, Dwayne Rames Bible, the Vulgate. You know, there's lots of ways to access the Catholic information about how they read Scripture. Then there's the Orthodox tent. And look, Orthodox people have a different angle than Catholics. Uh, they may be more similar in many ways, but they also have differences as well. And then there's a ton of Bible scholars who are atheists today, believe it or not. And they dominate the marketplace in university, and they produce an immense amount of scholarship. And sometimes an atheist scholar is really helpful because they just have totally different biases than Bible-believing uh, scholars or from these other perspectives. Or Unitarian Bible translations and scholarship. Or the Anabaptists. And Anabaptists are, are interesting because they seems like some of them are more thinking they're evangelicals, but a lot of them don't really think like evangelicals. And so they have uh, another, and we could, we could multiply out some other ideas of, you know, Mormons would be another tent. Uh, I, I haven't really done anything with Mormon scholarship, or Jehovah's Witnesses would be another tent. You know, there are these, lots of different tents and perspectives. And again, the point is not to endorse these, but to... to Get outside your own tent or the perspective that your Bible that you typically read is translated from so that you can see it from another angle. So let's look at Philippians 2.6 from the perspective of the Catholics and the mainliners to see how they do with it. So here's what the Catholics say. The New American Bible reads, Who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God something to be grasped. So they just left it alone as the form of God. It's a very strict, very literal translation. And then they added this footnote explaining ways to think about this verse. And this is how it reads. Either a reference to Christ's preexistence and those aspects of divinity that he was willing to give up in order to serve in human form, or to what the man Jesus refused to grasp at to attain divinity. Many see an allusion to the Genesis story, unlike Adam, Jesus, though in the form of God, did not reach out for equality with God, in contrast with the first Adam in Genesis 3, 5, and 6. Furthermore, we can look at what the NRSV, the mainliners, translate this verse, who, though he was in the form of God. Once again, they leave it alone. They don't inject their interpretation in. What's interesting is they do also leave a footnote that says, this is the Oxford Annotated Version, in the form of God may refer to divine status or simply pre-existence as a heavenly being or Adam's original immortality, which Christ renounced by becoming subject to death. Okay, so what, what are we seeing from these tents outside of the evangelical community? What we're seeing is that they're leaving it very literal, they're leaving it as form, and they're, and they're doing that very consciously because they realize there are at least two or three ways to interpret this verse, and they want to leave that up to the, the reader. So the first is that somebody who is that Jesus is existing as God in his nature, and that's what the NIV went for, the nature of God. And you, it doesn't take a genius to figure out that's because of later councils and creeds subsequent to the Bible, specifically at Nicaea, where Jesus was declared to be of the same nature or substance as the Father in 325. So that's what the NIV is going for. The problem with that is that then in the parallel construction, they have the nature of a slave. If you're thinking the nature of God is his, his essence, his being, what is the nature of a slave? Right? So that kind of destroys that a little bit, but they're at least being consistent with it, and I, I appreciate that, even if I don't find that interpretation at all compelling. Uh, the second option is to think of this section as Jesus existing as a pre-existent divine being. And the, so in this case, the form of God is like the classification of being divine or in the divine realm of existence or kind, which is another meaning for this word form, in Greek, uh, I refer you to the, the Brildag for that. Uh, I don't want to get too far, too deep in the weeds here. And then the third possibility is to look at Jesus as existing as a human being with divine prerogatives that he does not exploit or take advantage of. And uh, this verse cannot decide for you which one of these interpretations is correct. Therefore, you should translate it in such a way to allow people to figure it out on their own, based on their overall scope and reading of Philippians 2 in general, 
Philippians, the epistle at large, and then certainly Pauline theology and the Bible as a whole, what makes the most sense. Translating the, the phrase form of God allows the reader to decide what's best. The NIV, the GNT, and most overtly the NLT removed any non-evangelical interpretations from view and recast the text so that what they think it should mean, it said. This is commentary, this is not translation. So uh, that's what I wanted to say about uh, Philippians 2. Next time we're going to look at the subject of worship and how doctrinal bias affects Bible translation on the word proskuneo, which is a Greek word translated bow down or to worship. So we'll take a look at that next time in our continuing quest to understand how we got the Bible. Well, that's it for today on this one. If you would like to come on to Restitutio.org, you can find episode 348, God's Form or God's Nature, translating Philippians 2, and leave your comment or question there. Now, I realize that some of you are going to be very dissatisfied with this episode and probably with a number of the future episodes as well, because I'm not going into full exegesis on this passage. I'm not giving my interpretation. I'm just explaining what the options are and talking about the translation side of things. Uh, And I did that very intentionally because I don't want to extend this class longer than I need to, first of all, it's already very long, but also because to adequately deal with all the different interpretational issues, it would really take an immense amount of research, but also an immense amount of time to develop in an adequate kind of way that's not just knocking down straw men and representing other people's views in a weak or disrespectful manner. But I may do that in the future in a different kind of setting or series Now, if you found this episode helpful, do me a favor and share it online in whatever social media you you use so that others can find this episode and listen into the podcast as well. And I so appreciate the many of you who have have already done that and have supported Restitudio in so many different ways over the years. Thanks to all of you. Well, that's it for today. We'll see you next time. And remember, the truth has nothing to fear.